All right, so now we're on the stream. We'll give everybody a second to show up. Very weird video. I mean, I get it with level up and all that. Enter politics. I, I just say we get this thing started. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bring you in in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by my partner in podcasting, the only one that's ever mattered, Mr. Brian Brushwood. Well, hello, and it's easier than ever for reasons that we'll discuss later. Oh, yeah, to, we'll talk about that. Uh, so uh, you mentioned a while back that uh, wanting to maybe see a Starship launch. Yeah, I I, I was hoping I, I would just catch one, you know, just on the horizon. Uh, uh, I was always jealous of my, my brother, uh, the time that John Glenn took his second trip into space on a space shuttle. We, we were both on the phone, and he's like, uh, well, I'm like, oh, my God, history is happening. He's like, yeah, let me go watch it. And he walks out to his balcony, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, there it is. <laughs> so the next Starship launch is planning for March 14th. <gasps> oh, that's ill <laughs> tidings. <laughs> Why do you say that? Uh, isn't that the Ides of March? <laughs> oh, it's Pi, it's pi Day. Uh, oh, well, I guess, uh, I, I guess it is that. Maybe is it the... 13th of March? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, so they've uh, basically they plan to do a launch on March 14th with an attempt at trying to reach orbit. Uh, man, it's it's really interesting to watch them kind of uh, indifferently iterate. And as people want to call, you know, this explosion after that explosion of failure, for them to explain, uh, it's almost like a marketing move, except they're not spending any money. They're just patiently explaining, no, this is what it looks like to create a thing, is you have to have a lot of failures first. Yeah, there was something that came out, I forgot what it was, and it was like this critique of like, oh, well... This is why space, you can't trust SpaceX, though. Look at all these explosions. And, and you know, like, this is why the government method is more reliable. It's like, okay. Oh, man. Well, uh, somebody hasn't seen the right stuff where they have that beautiful <laughs> just collage of explosions. Well, and there's the whole, you know, shuttle launched 134 times, two out of those blew up well uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna make it sad then also we'll talk about the the first three lost souls where they got burned alive in the apollo mission apollo one yeah so yeah the point is to say is that like you know that the spacex method is test the heck out of these things you know don't you 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 can either say well we're gonna figure out everything right in the blueprint phase and just know that it's going to work and we go do it, which we clearly saw was not the case of the shuttle. Like the shuttle, the shuttle's anticipated rate of failure, which nobody likes to talk about was way, way, way lower than what it was. You know, oh, you no, no, no. It was, it was, it was bonkers. I, I recently uh, listened to the Freakonomics podcast where they were talking about uh, uh, Dr. Richard Feynman and, and um, uh, uh, with the astounding hypothesis to my ears, uh, not many people know about Dr. Feynman. And I was like, what? <laughs> but yeah. but uh, I, one of the things that he 
found notable was that their expected failure was like one in over a hundred thousand launches there would be a problem with. And it's like, uh, well, uh, no, no. And it's, it's an example of the system, the idealized version of the system versus the system in reality. Right. And in the idealized version of the system, it's like, well, you know, some solid rocket booster boosters, these, you know, three primary engines, it's a pretty simple, straightforward thing, but it's like, well, what was the problem? The fail cases. Well, one was the solid rocket boosters because of pork barrel politics or whatever. You couldn't build them in one solid unit. They had to be shipped in cylinders. They could fit on a railroad, which and, means and now we got these. And then on top of that, you had to attach them with what turned out to be a flawed, uh, flexible material. The the notorious O-ring that uh, was temperature yeah. sensitive. Yeah, it was a... It wasn't there in the original design, but then that was a necessity, a, a, a dot, dot, dot later on. Well, how will this affect the fit? Ah, shouldn't. Then you had, you know, what's going to be the impact of, you know, hey, it just goes from launch pad to space. Well, you leave it on the launch pad, there's moisture, you get ice that accumulates, and some of that ice breaks off and it hits a wing. What happens? And that was not a thing they anticipated. And, you know, one of the things after the first launch, they came back, they looked at the windshield and they saw micrometeorite fractures and they're like, Oh shoot! There's are you know some space to there's some there's impacts here like this is bad that could cause a fundamental problem because it's orbiting it could hit something so that's why the shuttle flew backwards because they figured the main engines could handle it because they don't use those engines you know other than a deorbit burn I don't even know if they use the primaries on that but basically well and uh, 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 for those uh, un unfamiliar uh, yes the space shuttle flew up but it didn't fly down, it just coasted down. And that was based on the integrity of the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the heat shield that it had. And then once it coasted down, like there was no, like if, if they were, if they had a problem, they couldn't just like go back to space. Like uh, that was it, you were yeah. gonna glide down. Yeah, cause it had to do a deorbit burn, which was to decelerate so it would lose its, you know, orbital velocity, but yeah. And it was, you know, it is an amazing achievement and it, you know, all the more for all the hoops they had to jump through to do that. I was talking to a friend yesterday who's working with uh, some NASA researchers on a project and she's been going through just a ton of the archives of like all the old, like NASA proposals and all the different stuff. And it's like, yeah, they were spinning out crazy ideas in the sixties, seventies, eighties, still to this day, but they were spinning out some really crazy ambitious ideas. And that was one of the things that was frustrating for some people. They watch SpaceX, the reusable rockets is, you know, they're, there are scientists and engineers who, you know, pitched that similar ideas back in the seventies, you know, said, Hey, we could do this. This is, you know, would it have been as practical would it have been able to pull it off? I don't know. But in, and I'd say that's where SpaceX gets its credit. It's one thing to say, I have an idea. It's like, well, putting it into space is key. And they did that. But there's been a lot of crazy and, ideas uh, like uh, even parts that they gave up, like uh, they're no longer trying to catch the fairing, right? Uh, they they gave up on trying to save that, or did they just figure out that? Yeah, they, it being they, a little yeah. bit wet is fine. Yeah, it was. That feels like kind of an Elon, like, well, you know, wanting to come up with this really fancy solution to win, because you're like, oh, you because they're like, oh, waterproofing is really hard. I'm like, I mean, maybe. You know, I get there's a light. <laughs> Tell that to boats. <laughs> well, that's the, the, the ratio weight. The weight ratio is a thing. But yeah, it, but it is it is a thing like maybe you really need to rethink that because, yeah, it is a clever idea to have this complete system where they never touch water. But, you know, I think they realized the physics of trying to predict. They thought they were getting better, but just reached the upper limits of like just the, the, the dynamics of trying to predict that are too hard. Well, and, and, and this is uh, – totally kind of peripheral, but, but there is a value. If what you're trying to do is attract people to your story, there is value to a novel set of systems on there. So even if, uh, yeah, for example, like it, it was a bold move to have drones that go out with Ian and Banks names on them and, you know, things land on them and all that stuff. Um, and maybe per the numbers, uh, that might not have been profitable, but it was so novel that like how much free 
storytelling do you get out of that? And e even trying to catch the fairings, whether it worked out or not, you know, it's sort of, it, it reminds me a little bit of the, um, uh, 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 I don't know, a Starman launch where they needed to have some kind of payload to launch. Might as well make it cool. Yeah, I guess it comes down to at what point, if the goal was to minimize cost and now they just drag him out of the water, you know, at what point do you realize this was a way more complicated problem we have and our net gain really is never going to be building a fully reusable rocket. Yeah. There's a total net gain to that, but building a, well, let's catch it instead of letting it fall in the water. And you know, how many tens of millions, hundreds of millions did they spend on that? Cause they, they spent quite a lot and it comes down to, you know, eventually they realized, yeah, let's just go the other way. So, and it's hard to know, you know, if you should keep pursuing it or not. Uh, and meanwhile, every time you do it, I mean, not, not that I don't want to rely on the old trope that all publicity is good publicity, but certainly it made headlines every single time they tried. Uh, and then maybe they saw diminishing returns and they're all like, yeah, that's about all the free advertising that we need. Well, and I don't know that it was good that it, it's if the headlines that you keep failing at a thing and then you give up a thing, I don't know if that's really, it, it's they're, they're better distracting, they're better stories that can be told there, I would say. Not that anybody cared or it was really pivotal that they kept dropping that. I, I, I would, I would counter with, and, and who's to say where the line is, but there's a lot of stories of people who, uh, uh, you know, including uh, the canonical one, Thomas Edison, you know, who identified, you know, 10,000 ways to not make a light bulb, allegedly, you know, that that kind of stuff. Yeah, but that's a post hoc story. And that led to a light bulb. You know, we, we, we don't we don't get the story of 3M, you know, Apple is not going to want to do the story on the $10 billion they wasted trying to build a self driving car. Like Apple has kept that story locked down and does not, that story will make its way, but Apple does not want that story told because they just don't look good. They just look incompetent. Uh, sp speaking of Apple stories, how, how still in love are you with your ski goggles? I mean, I, well, love is a word that I don't think I used before. Um, I, you know, my, my, my stance is still the same. It's a great demo, but it is a, it is an extremely compromised form factor. It is a very cool thing to use. But when I, when I first review it, like, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to use it for day to day. Uh, I've talked with other people, including, you know, some people, some pioneers in VR, and we've all had sort of the same feelings, which is physically, it was a compromise that, that, you know, the, the, the rumor was the original idea was to take all of the, uh, Everything, all of the processing power, all that stuff that you need there, which also requires the bigger battery, everything like that, all the processing power, et cetera. And, you know, cause like this is, this is the actual, you know, for audio listeners, the physical device is pretty small, but there's still a ton of weight in here as far as GPUs, everything else like that, et cetera, which then negate may mean that they had to go ahead and they couldn't fit a battery on here too. But like original plan was to just reduce it to just the visual elements and put all the processing and everything else they needed to do that couldn't be put on here and put it on a wireless device, put it in like a, 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 you know, basically a desktop little cube or box or whatever, and have that communicate. So then, you know, you'd be reducing a lot of the weight here. Okay. And you probably could put the battery pack on there, smaller battery, et cetera. The story was Johnny Ive had a fit. Johnny Ive insisted it had to be a standalone device. So they pursued trying to make this a standalone device, but they realized to have the compute that they wanted to have to do all that was going to be extremely resource intensive. And so I had left Apple and then, you know, I think they got so far down that path of what's this device supposed to be. And they realized that they probably had a plan to put in a battery pack or something on there and realized they only got like 20 minutes of battery life. They had to make the battery pack external. And at that point, well, guess what? I now have a second unit. I have a second device. And I think they made the wrong choice on that. I, I get the idea of the idea of the pure device. It's completely standalone. They did not deliver that. They delivered a thing that is heavy on the face. You know, everybody I've talked to has them all says, yes, it feels heavy. They can't imagine themselves wearing this for very long. Um, you know, I, you know, I think if you have a head like Charlie Brown, you'll probably be fine. Cause I've heard somebody like, Oh, it's not heavy at all. And it's like, well, you can't discount other people's subjective experiences. So I think as a, 
as an experience, I think they they nailed a lot of things in there. But you know, my other big crit was there was no Apple did not build a unique Apple app for that that shows you to justify spatial computing. There is no, you know, they could have built like my favorite thing that Google did back when they were experimenting with VR was Tilt Brush, this wonderful painting program. Oh, yeah. which is probably 10 years old now. What would a 2024 version of that made by really capable designers and engineers be like? They could have built a fantastic, super easy, fun thing. Cause in Tilt Brush, I could go create, I, I could go create a scene from Dune and then add some little animations and then send it to my friends and share it, which would be cool. And now 2024, you could do way more sophisticated stuff and share those things with people without having to go too crazy. I mean, they could have built their version of Rec Room. There was a lot of low hanging fruit that literally for the price of an Apple commercial, you know, uh, you could have worked a developer team and have built a great experience. They did not do that, which I'm personally worried about Apple. I think they have great teams working on different components. I think they have great people working GPUs, great people working on a lot of the image processing stuff great teams but when it comes in they're trying to bring them all together to build a new device this is what we get a thing that's really unsupported as far as example applications do and a really good use case for what to do and i'm nervous about apple to be honest with you well and uh every time they make an announcement that misses the mark and becomes a punchline is a a heavy blow to their reputation uh, which you know heretofore has been uh, by and large sterling. Yeah. And it's not, it's not easy to like little things they do really well. Like AirPods are great. I mean, my AirPods don't like to talk to my Apple TV, but that's an Andrew problem. But you know, sometimes AirPods aggressively disconnect and reconnect, but by and large by themselves, it was a simple little thing to go into. And I think they really did a fantastic product here. Uh, I think that for, you know, a device like this, I think that, Yes, there is a rule. Spatial computing is going to be a thing. To what extent it will be a thing, I don't know. But man, they just failed to make, you know, you got your iPhone, you pull up mobile Safari and you realize, wow, it's the real web. That's amazing. You know, you pull out your iPad and you start working with a pencil and you start working on that scale and you go, oh yeah, this is what tablet computing should be like. You pull out your Apple Vision Pro, you go through a couple of demos. You're like, oh, this is what it's like to have multiple screens. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like a simulation of what I've already experienced before. <laughs> yeah, I I play with it a little bit, but then I don't. I would probably touch it in a week because I'm like, what what am I going to go do? And like, they could have done things like read it, like one that low hanging fruit would have been build a better like paint tilt brush type program because you can share those things because then that becomes a cool thing. Hey Brian, put your headset on, go check out this thing I built. This is really fun, really cool more you know other opportunities there you know what would video you can shoot spatial video in there what should a spatial video edit like what should just editing video in a spatial environment be like and you know you know talk about like this before like you could you know do i we're used to putting things into a screen like video editing right now basically was an evolution you know the you know the first the first non-linear video editor remember what that was uh, I, 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 it was a premiere, uh, but, but, but I know that, I know that quite literally we're still working with simulacrums of actual film editing where it's like, go up to this point, literally slice it, put these two parts together, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a project called edit droid. Now, if anybody follows copyright history, uh, may remember that, uh, droid, uh, is a term that George Lucas had copyrighted. And this was built by a spinoff from Lucasfilm called Droid Works. And uh, okay, so it, it, if I search for edit droid on, uh, on YouTube, yeah, one word edit, edit, one word edit droid in, 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 uh, in Wikipedia, you'll get it. So what happened was edit droid, and then they came up with, there was a version called uh, Diva, which was like a, a nonlinear editing system or whatever which was bought by, or Avid bought it and developed it. So Avid became Avid Editing Systems. Oh, bought of course. Up the IP from Lucasfilm. So that's where it came from. George Lucas, his team came up with the first edit, nonlinear based editing system. Uh, so uh, Avid used to be very, very 
complicated. Uh, uh, Premiere made it very simple and approachable. But there's a 40-minute uh, documentary called Edit Droid, The Rise and Fall. Um, oh, my uh, God. I got to find that. On the, on the, Cause like what they, on YouTube. What, what they did, which was brilliant, was remember back then, you don't have, you know, this thing was made, uh, gosh, when did they make this thing? Like, this is like mid-1980s. Like, you didn't have, like, RAM or anything to do that. So they used laser discs. And so it was a bunch of laser discs going back and forth to allow you to do the system. I mean, just just a really, really clever, you know, the idea that you one day you would have enough RAM to hold an entire, you know, film, whatever, was just a crazy idea. I mean, but that was nonsense. So saving that to watch later. Yeah. Uh, so anyhow, I, I digress. The point is, is that, you know, we as you talked about, like, you know, we went from, you know, I was a, my first job as a teenager, I worked at a movie theater. I had to assemble films and I had to sit down to the little bench with the little, you know, the, the little magnifier thing to look at the frames, make sure I match that stuff and tape them. And then I had to break them down and do that. But anyhow, the point is like, yeah, there could have been a really cool, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I sit in a room where I have all my film clips hanging like pieces of film. Maybe that's not the way to do it. I don't know. But like, man, it would have been cool to really experiment with what a spatial computing could be instead of, Literally, it's like, here's your iPad screen. Now here's your iPad screen and your Apple Vision Pro. It's like, cool. That's that's actually one of the things that I wanted to do, uh, uh, and, and probably it's upcoming on the Mono Rogue, is actually shoot something in 8 millimeter and record separately using a tape recorder and do the ADR and the Foley work and the manual editing and run it on an actual projector to like, like, like who actually assembles short films that way anymore. Yeah. There's plenty of gear out there though. So, mm -hmm. I mean the, the way, I mean the way you do it now is you just take your footage and you do a transfer. So then you edit it and you get your time codes and then you can go back and then have your film put back to spec on because that was originally what that was originally what electronic film editing was and even for tape tape editing was you would do a very very low res version and store that and that's like how your video toaster work like a video toaster for editing is you would store a super low res version of that edit that get your time codes and go back and run the tapes back and forth and record out well, and, and that still exists in the form of uh, proxies, right? Where it's like you'll you'll not actually render everything that you're working with, but you'll have proxies that that uh, like yeah, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. and then that, and then the other thing, and then you hit the render button, and yep. then you go get a cup of coffee. Yeah, exactly. And that that came from the day of you would you would they'd have what they call the uh, the work print. The work print was that the copy of the film was a bit more rugged of them. And you hear sometimes we found a work print for this. That was one a little bit like a thicker cellulite stock, whatever that could handle that. You would figure out your edits on the work print, you know, and then send your sheets off to like do the fine print. Uh, oh man, I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds. Uh, maybe, maybe now is a good time for us to remind people of that they could support the show by going to patreon.com slash weird things, keep us loud, live, and independent, get exclusive access to the after things portion of the podcast, and uh, uh, most importantly, uh, be cool. I think I had a dream last night that I had to do the podcast by myself, and I remember to do the commercial break. <laughs> You I ever, have this hazy memory coming back to me of doing that, of, of like, because now it triggers like, yeah, and like, think speaking of people, you know, what's really important is people make this podcast work. That's why you should support weird things. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, so who knows where the future is going to go? Who knows what's going to happen up next? Things are just moving so, so quickly and. It is absolutely uh, cool to see what's oh, happening. Uh, so, uh, 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 oh, sorry. It sounds like you have something. Oh, I got a story, Brian. Okay, I got a story. All right. Unless you got a story, I mean, I can, I can pause. Oh, I, I mean, we we can always defect uh, or, or default back to AI talk. That's always on the menu. Let me let me just do a detour into biotech talk, and then we'll go back to AI talk. All right. Okay. So, uh, biotech. Colossal Biosciences, which is the company that bills themselves as the first de-extinction com de company, says they have created stem cells they think will 
basically accelerate their effort to resurrect the woolly mammoth. And basically they said that they've been able to create stem cells. You know, I think they're you know, using mammoth DNA and they're very optimistic that they're going to be able to make the next big step. So, uh, okay. So I, before anybody gets upset, like I, I think all of us know that it's not going to be actually a perfect replica of the woolly mammoth, but I assume it's going to be close enough. It's going to. Well, look I mean, like they're one. they're working from they're they're working from woolly mammoth DNA, right? And the idea is, you if you can get a viable embryo, plant an elephant, and you should probably end up with, you know, a, a there there are there are things that come about like, like not everything that determines your final shape or form is entirely in the genetics. You know, we've talked about that before there's things called, you know, uh, there's things called like surface myelation. There are proteins that attach themselves to DNA. The, the effect between the mother's body and the embryo, she can pass on certain things, you know, uh, gut biota, things like that, perhaps whatever. So anyhow, but it would be, you know, it's not like they're going to be, you know, Jurassic Park in this with like, you know, putting in, you know, frog DNA and stuff. Well, although um, the, it, uh, I, I, the, the first time I heard about this, I want to say it was 10 to 14 years ago where they were talking about like there's certain aspects of a healthy North American biome that require a megafauna. And uh, North America were one of the ones that hunted them all away. And the idea was to let's get something close enough to the woolly mammoth. Let's get some DNA. And I think at the time they were comparing it to cloning of Dolly the sheep. Uh, and let's get them in embryos. Let's have them gestate within elephants. Uh, and then over generations, get them more and more woolly mammoth like, and then just let them go. Uh, do, do whatever megafauna needs to do in the environment. Uh, do you remember right. that? Yeah, let me read you the AI summarization of this. The article discusses a breakthrough by Colossal Bioscience as a company aiming to resurrect the woolly mammoth. The company has created induced pluripotent stem cells from elephant cells. I got that wrong. They weren't using woolly mammoth, which can be programmed to develop into any type of cell. This is a given step towards their goal of producing proxy mammoths, which would be Asian elephants genetically engineered to resemble woolly mammoths, which you talked about, Brian. While the proxy species wouldn't be an exact copy of the extinct animal, Colossal believes they, that releasing these animals to Siberia could help restore the ancient mammoth steppe ecosystem and combat climate change by slowing permafrost melting. However, the article notes that there are ethical concerns surrounding the use of endangered elephants as surrogates and that artificial rooms may be necessary. Despite the progress made with IPSCs, the article insights there are still significant technological and ethical hurdles to overcome. So uh, yeah, they they they're trying to do exactly what you said. I I was wrong. They are trying to Jurassic Park this stuff. And <laughs> well, hey, what a I, woolly mammoth! Let's uh let's just take a elephant DNA and add in a, the Rogaine DNA. Well, and and thing. and, and uh, really, they're they're trying to what uh, uh, buffalo it uh, uh, or bison it basically, where it's like you know there there's this unoccupied niche that needs to be uh, that or that we assume ought to be filled for uh, North America. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, I, I think it's a great, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a cool idea. I'm all for it. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens if we put them into an ecosystem that's not really, you know, that could use a bunch of large mammals stomping around. We'll, and we'll, we'll call it the Crichton test. Does nature yeah. find a way? Well, let's go hypothetical. Okay. Let's say they find that because uh, they're going for Asian elephants, I believe, because genetically that's the closest, you know, relative to it. But um, you go use Asian elephants and you get your baby pseudo mammoth. I don't know what the growth cycle is, but, you know, let's hypothesize that 25 years from now we got a herd. Uh, and then, uh, oh, 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 wait, whoa, 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 uh, this is fun. 
uh, at what point do we realize we've made a terrible mistake? At what point do we realize we have the equivalent of the feral pig problem in North America? No, <laughs> they're very, they are very easy to hunt, Brian. Okay. They're very, we, <laughs> so we easy have, we, that with we, sticks, all of humans were able to eliminate them. <laughs> yeah, we, we handled it. We handled it. Did it once, we'll do it again. Uh, but I, I, I think more the idea of that, you know, that's going to be all of a sudden there's going to be nature documentaries, things like that. It's going to be an interesting thing because now we're going to want to study, you know, what are these, you know, how do these creatures interact with and whatnot? What are they like? What what behaviors do we see? How different are they? You know, how different are they from Asian elephants? What happens? Because also they're going to be in a, a further north than than they have been. I mean, during a interglacial. Uh, so. You know, the colder part of interglacial, so I don't uh, know. I mean, I think it'd be fascinating. If anybody read the book, uh, the follow-up to Jurassic Park, uh, The Lost World, uh, was a meditation where um, uh, Michael Crichton focused on the idea of, okay, so genetically they're identical to the originals, but how much does, you know, a mother teaching a kid – uh, 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 perpetuate over time. But like, uh, uh, there's one scene where like velociraptors are like, they don't even know how to do anything like, like moms are attacking kids or whatever, which strikes me as uh, very Michael Crichton. -y. But, um, uh, that would be interesting to wonder if, if the behaviors, uh, even matter given given the, the, the genetics and the you know uh, the passing on of memes how do you mean oh um well i mean like um take a look at humans there's a, a fair spread of humans who are all genetically give or take identical but different humans get taught different things over time so imagine mm -hmm. all of humanity just stops for a few minutes slash eons and then humanity starts again. Like w w is there value in studying these new humans and interpreting their behaviors uh, and, 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 and mapping them on to what you assume old humans did uh, or, or, or is it the case where, uh, you know, all of our myths, legends, and behaviors uh, actually matter, you know, are, are, are practical things, everything from Almost personal hygiene like a, to, uh, yeah, no, go ahead. Let me break it Almost like a nature versus nurture. Right. <laughs> well, and, and, okay. So the question again is like, how valuable is it to watch? And, and well, it the answer is how much, yeah. Be, 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 if it's one of these things, if we if we assume we're to get, we're going to see what we expect, one it can be slightly confirming you know that. But if we see things we don't expect, and and I wouldn't surprise me if we might find there might be some behaviors that are different. You know, and and comparing you know I I think woolly mammoths and Asian elephants are going to be much more closely alike than let's say killer whales and you know uh, forms of like you know uh, other dolphins or whatever, but you know, killer whales, you know, how, how are they? Well, they tend to be in these sort of matrial matriarchal groups, you know, the mother and her offspring and whatnot. And that's interesting. Do we see, and that's hardwired, you know? And so we would see this, like, depending on how much, you know, are they able to use woolly? I don't know if they're going to use any woolly man with DNA at all, or if they're just going to try to like backwards work their way to a thing. But even, even the idea of being in a thing with a harsher winter cycle than any elephant species deals with right now, does that change things? You know, is, is the, you know, are you going, who's going to be the alpha there? Is it going to be the one that prepares for that cycle? The ones that's able to fatten up and stay stronger through there. Like you might see things just literally by just a, a, a temperature differential might elicit behaviors we didn't expect. Uh, okay. Well then let me walk back my, like, I'm not, I'm not going to say that there's no value in observing, but uh, in, in terms of one-to-one -one correlation, uh, 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 like whatever it is we get will be its thing and we can maybe into it, you know, kind of default, uh, desires or motivations, but that's about it. Um, 
Maybe. I mean, th- th- there there can be, again, think about it this way. is like, one, you're put in into a different environment than elephants that exist ex- pre- currently, right? Does the morphology alone make a big difference? Does, does you know, and and also the difference we're going to put, too, is we're going to put in an environment where it's still, well, we'll see, like, will wolves start to, per, you know, stop, start to hunt them? Will wolves start to do that? You know, like, what what will happen? And so I think that you might see things, emergent behaviors that explain things we didn't understand before. Remember, if you said putting, you know, figuring out part of the cladiogram to put dinosaurs or put, thera- you know, theropods or put like, you know, uh, you know, T-Rex and stuff like that. Is it a bird? Not a bird. Once you understood bird, you really things started to make sense. You started to understand things a little bit better, you know. Two is the complexity that birds, you know, bird species can be extremely complex with a wide range of behavior. And so I'd say that, you know, it can, it could, you know, give us, I think, give us some insight too to like, you know, what, what is it, you know, what does have like large, you know, having, you know, ginormous herbivores like that walking across a tundra, you know, what happens? So if you're going to, if you're in Vegas and you're going to place a bet, uh, either in number of years or yes, no, like, does Colossal actually deliver us, you know, uh, uh, something that looks like a woolly mammoth? Uh, do, it, do, it, do they, do we get a hairy elephant in 20 years? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it genetically identical to, no. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing, is that in genetics, one of the things that we're starting to be able to get into is the ability to create hybrid DNA, like we can, we can do programmable DNA. Now we can sit down at a computer, start adding sequences, do this, have a genetic sequence or produce that DNA strand. If we get to the point where we're successfully able to continuously put that inside of a sperm or inside of an ovum, um, and get them to link up, you know, or place the genetic structure in it, just a recently fertilized thing. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's going to be as close as you want to get it. Uh, and I told, and I told you that the kind of the really, I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. I'm, I'm not going to name names. I have a friend, it's a paleontologist, who's been involved in research where they have looked inside fossilized bones and found that certain structures are still there. And one of the things they found inside of there, when they would crack open a bone, open them inside there, and find these like tiny little weird balls of, of iron, which were sort of weird. And then when they start to dismantle them, they find what looks like what could be genetic sequences. Oh. 65 million euro bones. Oh, that's wild. So, so uh, like the, the iron filings, uh, for lack of a better word, um, basically like well, wax, well not, like not, wax not, models not, mushed up against those very sensitive. More, more, more like what happens is that, that iron, the presence of iron and the presence of DNA may create a binding thing that prevents the DNA from de- decaying. So I mean, this may be published research by now. So let me take a look. Oh. <laughs> and wow. the, uh, let me look for this. So the, 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 the key, key takeaway there is, is that we realized that with, um, yeah, there is. When you have, you might say like, yeah, but it's a bunch of little fragments and stuff like, yeah, but, you know, museum shelves are filled with dino bones that may all potentially contain some fra- trace fragments of DNA. And all I need is a bunch, you know, you know, if, if I take two strands of DNA and break them up, they're not going to break, generally speaking, in the same places. They're going to break in different places. And I can use that with a computer to reassemble what the full sequence would look like. Right. Uh, so, oh, uh, this is evidence of proteins, chromosomes, and chemical markers of DNA and exceptionally preserved dinosaur cartilage. This was January 2020. One of the researchers was Mary Schweitzer, who's a and, and my friend Jack Warner. So, yeah, they published this. So, uh, they had a duck-billed dinosaur, which this is 2020, so this has been up there. So, they found basically uh, evidence of different forms of cellular preservation that extends far beyond what we consider, let's say, the half-life for DNA. Um, you know, for those, you know, DNA half-life basically says that over a period of times, X thousands of number of years, DNA breaks down by half and by half, a half and half continues to the point that when you're trying to go back more than like a few hundred thousand years or something, there's not going to be anything left. But the problem is that assumes average conditions. We know that if I put DNA inside of a freezer, 
you know, it will last much longer. But you'd be like, oh, those conditions don't exist. Correct. But we've established there are other conditions. So it's not like half life for radioactive decay where there's nothing I can do to prevent that decay. DNA half life happens because of a chemical and, you know, entropic processes brought in by heat or other things. But the idea here is that, well, it might have things might bind with this stuff and then prevent that decay. Did um, uh, I'm, I'm going to pivot here real quick, but uh, uh, did you happen to read the articles that were boohooing on there's less oxygen in Europa than expected? Uh, no, I didn't hear that. Thanks for the killjoy. Yeah, sorry. Uh, whoopsie doodle. Uh, <laughs> but uh, who knows? Well, the 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 question is, let's see, what is the... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, there there may be other factors and things that take place there too, like one of the things here is like, why, you know, how did we get so much nice oxygen in our atmosphere? I mean, the answer was we waited a long time to develop uh, animals. We, we just had a yeah, lot of plants for plants. a very yeah. long yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Algae. A, a, oxygen is a pollutant. <laughs> oxygen. The oxygen we love and crave was actually a you know byproduct of all this algae producing this. And they, they ruined the earth before we did. They ruined the earth with all this, delicious delicious oxygen Got and it's one of these things that you ah no species has ever affected thing on a planetary scale algae enters the chat uh, yeah right <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the reason we're here right now uh so. yeah I, I i don't know that it changes our expectations too too much as far as like you know do is it worthy to continue to explore and try to find life throughout the universe. However, uh, uh, that, 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 that was a setback. Europa was, was, was a sweet, sweet target for, for a hot minute. Yeah. And again, that we are, uh, they're looking at hydrogen outgassing from the moon surface. They estimate the amount of oxygen produced to be around 26 pounds every second. And let me look through here. Um, they're looking at surface and so we don't know we don't know what could be going on subsurface we really don't know what's going on under that like remember there is a ice shield there is then the whole subsurface ocean and so as far as the oxygen production that could be happening they're looking at like how much oxygen could be happening externally and then working its way internally i'm going to give you like a kind of a, a crazy thing so uh hydrogen production right hydrogen where does hydrogen come from uh, the Big Bang. Okay. Where does the hydrogen that we have on Earth come from? Where does the free hydrogen? The, the, the... Uh, well, I know here on Earth, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, I believe that uh, if, if we suddenly wanted to run on fuel cells, we would have to use electrolysis to break down water uh, into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, uh, otherwise, I know that... Hydrogen is problematic uh, insofar as that it likes very much to float all the way to the edge of the atmosphere and then get blown away by the solar winds. Um, be, be, beyond that, uh, I, I suspect that there's more you have to tell me. What? <laughs> uh, so the, the conventional sort of theory was is that we had um, X amount of hydrogen that was you know the, obviously the hydrogen bound up in water in co2 and everything like that uh not co2 but uh, and and, and, and hydrocarbons H2. are are very very solid yeah yeah yeah, that, yeah exactly so there, there's forms of that there and then that the hydrogen that we had was basically kind of what just sort of seeped up from the earth's core or whatever out through there and whatnot that any other hydrogen you wanted you had to go yeah you had to go crack something you know, like a cho2 or h2o or whatever to get that hydrogen out of it okay so there was in you know a lot of a lot of our understanding about the available resources materials on our earth is based upon a certain amount of scientific exploration and a lot of like petrochemical exploration and petrochemical exploration looks for specific things you want to dig an oil well where you have a really high chance of digging an oil well that's why fracking was such a big revolution because fracking came up with this idea of getting things that were traditionally ignored like yeah, there's stuff down there, but you can't get to it. Fracking's I, like I, 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 
I you may rem- rem- remember this. I I don't know if some of the listeners have ever heard, but like like that's why when I was in second grade, my family moved to Colorado. Is we we lived in Denver, Colorado, just outside of Littleton, because my dad was part of the exploratory team that was trying to figure out uh, whether whether or not shale oil whether the juice was worth the squeeze because my dad got into petrochemicals in the late seventies at the height of, you know, the OPEC, uh, you know, cartel restrictions and so on. And uh, what they figured out was, yep, it's there, not profitable to, to do it. And then the revolutionary aspect of fracking uh, happened and um, uh, 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 fracking, for those of you guys who don't know, because you are releasing liquid natural gas petroleum that can be made into liquid uh, petroleum, uh, there are so much less carbon in there. Uh, the American boom of uh, uh, made possible by fracking is, is, I believe, measurably the single biggest advancement in uh, pushing back... Uh, 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 climate change. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if I'm overstating it when I say it that way. <laughs> yeah, it, it is the, the goal of the goal of basically reducing the amount of carbon that we contribute through industrial processes and whatnot is reducing the amount of C in whatever, you know, the carbon and whatever you're breaking apart or doing that. And Methane, yes, has a carbon in there, but actually has more hydrogen. So the more hydrogen, you, the more hydrogen atoms that are inside of there, the higher the rate of energy you get from there. And that's a good thing. If you go back and look at like coal, it's, you know, it's like a, you know, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. It's very small ratio, but methane, these things get better and better with more hydrogen. And so that's kind of the goal. Uh, and hydrogen economy, we get into the problem with that of like, it's just horrible to trans, transport, whatever. It just really, it, I, I had a, I had almost a yelling match fight with somebody once over this was an engineer who was just all in on, you know, you know, the hydrogen economy and everything like that. And this was like four years ago. And I'm like, it's like, you know, I got to break it down. I, I got to convert something into hydrogen. So I've already got the energy and I'm applying it to that to do that. Then I got to transport it. And I'm like, I'm not like a big believer that lithium ion is the future of everything. But I was just like, I just, to me, it just seemed like too many impractical things. And plus I plug, I drive my car home at night. I plug it in done you know but anyhow so theory had been that kind of like basically that hydrogen you know there kind of be what was available etc in france there was a location where they had had extracted like some hydrogen before and they thought they would kind of got all of it out but then it continued to produce hydrogen and that was and it was you know basically like naturally occurring hydrogen that seeps up from the earth and they're like wait why what why is this happening and there's a couple of locations where I think they think they've observed this, where they're seeing hydrogen continuously come through ground sources. And the theory is, there's a theory that shows that there can be a geochemical process where very, very, basically, you know, you get a certain amount of pressure, certain kind of rock formation, certain amount of liquid there, and it just starts producing the hydrogen. And that basically that you might have a lot more naturally produced hydrogen in places we didn't realize. And that's when back to the whole thing of Europa, whatnot, like, like, yes, they're looking at surface availability of oxygen. There might be some processes or things like that that we're not aware of that could be producing oxygen at some other level. Um, oh, man, there's so many threads that are very tempting to chase. Um, uh, I don't know, I, 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 but, but also we're far enough into the show that I feel like we, we need to not go all the way out into the universe. Yeah. Uh, so but, if anybody wants to Google it, the term is white hydrogen. White hydrogen stands for naturally occurring hydrogen. And uh, 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 that would be something created here internally on Earth. Yeah. Which would be huge for fuel, fuel cells, but uh, has yet to be f- found, confirmed, and... Uh, yeah, we, we have a number of processes we understand that create it. Like, like well, sources can be... One is one. The primary source is degassing. What we talked about before, just the hydrogen that's here from the formation of the Earth, just scraping its way up. But then they talk about the reaction of water with ultra basic rocks, serpentization, which is another process where this can happen. We don't know the scale at which this happens. That might happen at a greater frequency than we realized, and we just haven't been looking for it. 
so much. Uh, I assume that's mainly because that's a highly speculative bet. But anyway, uh, 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 well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, just to clarify, yeah, because if you didn't think it was there, you weren't going to invest the money in looking for it. Right. Right. Uh, 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 we got time to talk picks. Sure. What are you into? I, I have, um, I have a very fun youtube channel which let me pull up the name for um which i discovered completely by accident and well i mean i discovered it completely by algorithm by on purposeness (laughs) do do you like high energy physics brian i know you do who doesn't (laughs) yeah woolly mammoths and high energy physics who doesn't love both of them (laughs) i mean let me rephrase it do you like things like some dude making a 20,000 volt plasma knife Ugh. from Halo. That always terrifies me, but uh, I'll not deny, like, I'll not deny that I respect the players. Yeah. How about making a 120,000 volt ray gun? Does that sound cool to you? I mean, that sounds like a 120,000 volt ray gun. How about experimenting with one of my favorite uh, th- theoretical ideas of the future, which is going to be ionic wings or ionic surfaces for basically the idea of using electric ionic fields to move air across aerodynamic surfaces. So you could have airplanes completely no moving parts and really change the structure of that. Does that sound cool to you? Oh, that sounds very cool. Have you ever heard of a cold plasma torch? Uh, I, okay, now you're just making stuff up. So here's the thing about plasma, which you may not realize. So you get plasmas when the electrons sort of flow free, whatever. If you get the electrons to flow really far away from the atoms, you're colder. So you can actually interact with the plasma and touch it and not feel like it's hurting you because you're basically just touching a gas filled with a bunch of electrons. So you one of the uses for this is you can actually do this by creating a high high energy electrical field and pumping helium through it and then the helium will you know they create a plasma state again that's where the electrons flow free go it, you create like a needle and you can get that to sort of extend beyond that needle point and they're using that now to look at treating wounds because you can actually use that to basically kill all the bacteria here so i present to you the plasma channel it's it's a whole channel about plasma Yes, it's called the Plasma Channel, Brian. Uh, okay, go on. Continue to sell. <laughs> so he goes in and does a bunch of really cool things, experimenting with like high energy. He's a great explainer. He's building things like building like plasma turbines, which basically just are have no moving parts but generate wind thrust. He's when he did a trip to Helion, which is one of my favorite uh, nuclear fusion companies, which is working on building a fusion reactor, which will basically have you know no moving parts won't be steam powered but we'll just go straight from fusion to energy to electrical production instead of like trying to you know steam you know which has been the answer for everything he is a great explainer highly recommend it does some really cool demos and stuff and you just start to appreciate i think it's a great way if you want to learn about things like plasma and high energy physics etc just just a really fun channel so that is he builds a fuser, shows you his fuser, which, you know, as a fuser is, you you know, you can build your own fusion reactor. You're just going to be really hard to get, you know, net energy out of it. The fuser is one of the oldest ideas, and he shows that, you know, it's really neat stuff that he builds. Right on. And so uh, that is the plasma channel. He does something, too, you might find kind of cool is using high energy to control fire, to move fire around. All right. You have my attention. <laughs> I am 100% here for this. Um, uh, Have you seen the, the, the Dune part two yet? Have we already talked about this? Not yet. I have not seen it yet. Uh, Then I will be relatively spoiler free outside of to say that historically um, every iteration of Dune uh, I've experienced. And this is everything from reading the book to playing the CD-ROM game to the uh, uh, air quotes, Alan Smithy directed version of it. Uh, I've, I've loved all of them. However, my favorite part has always been the, um, the kind of, uh, Game of thrones House Harkonnen versus House Atreides versus mm-hmm. House Horno part of it. 
Um, and after that, it gets what I previously had thought of as kind of hippy dippy, like, okay, now, now, now we're just crawling around Saudi Arabia, uh, stealing oil, uh, while, while the, the, uh, the Catholic church is leering over us. Um, so I was very, very pleased with Dune part two, because it took what in general, the, you know, the mystical parts of it that I never really dug and made me really, really dig them. It's great. It's great. It's highly recommended. Um, uh, if you have the means, the Alamo draft house put together a special menu, including a bunch of, uh, spiced popcorn. And I don't know what was in that popcorn, but it created this absolutely wonderful surreal atmosphere as you, 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 you could smell it as other people ordered it. And then you ended up buying it and then you ended up eating it. And it's like, like, Oh man, this is, this is a very trippy uh, placebo. I heard the presence. worst part though, is all the glowing blue eyes in the theater kind of really were distracting. <laughs> I mean, luckily, we asked them to take off their Apple VR <laughs> devices. Oh, that, the spice was causing the eye, the blue within blue. Now. Yeah, no, it was a, uh, it was, a, it was a real trip, man. I, I liked it. I liked it quite a bit. It was, it was way good. I, I'm looking. I'm excited to see it. I am, you know, a huge, huge. We just the closest theater to us is just one of those, like you know, the screens got ripped. They don't care. There's another chain theater a little further away from us that's just the i don't want to wait to go for home to watch dune but a lot of time movies i just just wait for home because mike yeah i'm gonna have a better experience at my house than you know going out to the movie theater because they just don't take care of the, you know the one near us like they literally have their they're using an underpowered projection for the screen so everything's uh, like dim yeah you know and the other one you go to it's like one of those this chain theaters it's just like oh the screen's ripped this is like they just don't care because like yes 70 80 percent of people don't care but often over time they just don't show up you know like i used to go see a movie a week it was uh it was a really really magical experience because um uh it's been a a, a, a minute since i went to an alamo draft house and they're back to caring very very hard about stuff like um they, uh, in my opinion, they got a little bit lazy on their uh, pre-show materials, but this time they did just this incredible, uh, uh, you ain't never heard of Dune, watch this 20-minute thing, and then, uh, 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 like, showing clips from every single iteration of Dune that ever was, and then, and it's like, are you getting bored? Watch uh, Christopher Walken perform Weapon of Choice by Fatboy Slim. And then it's like, uh, uh, oh, wait, is it relevant that he happens to be the emperor, <laughs> Shaddam the Fourth, in this movie? Well, that's convenient. It's a, uh, uh, it's, it, it was a great experience, man. It was really, really good. Cool, man. I'm excited. I, I found, you know, it's just I had a, a tremendous amount of nervousness and trepidation, you know when this was coming out and then it seems like everybody's very pleased with it. So, and I, and I asked, I said, my, my opinion, I, I enjoyed Dune first one, but I, you know, having read the books and getting to the middle of the book and that one, and it's like, ah, and the story ends there. It's like, wait, what? And I'm like, well, how are you going to judge it? I'm going to judge it. Want to see part two. This is, this is my first time of uh, uh, experiencing anything beyond the first book. And we're trying to speak well, spoilers. This is the first book. Uh, well, uh, part three will be a little bit beyond the first book, I believe. Um, uh, yeah, part three is Dune Messiah. Part three is supposed to be Dune Messiah. Exactly. I, which I never yeah. read, and I don't know okay. nothing about. So, so every version of Dune I've ever experienced has been. And that's the end. It was great. He oh. was great. You never, and, you never uh, watched the uh, Sci-Fi yeah, Channel? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, I did watch the Sci-Fi Channel one, um, although I, 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 I didn't love it. Uh, but, 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 uh, but bro, I, they did. They did the sequel. They did. They did. They did Dune Messiah. Dune Children are Dune. They wrapped them together. Uh, uh, man, it, it must not have stuck in my mind. But my, my point is, uh, uh, from what I have heard, 
by way of our friend Justin Robert Young, uh, uh, there are more elements that I, for the first time, am going to experience uh, if and when part three comes out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, yeah, Villeneuve is like he wants to do something else, then he'll go do that. And also, we have the series, the HBO series coming out. There's an HBO Dune series coming out? Yes, it was originally it was going to be Sisterhood of Dune, which was about the formation, like the early days of the Bene Gesserit, based on the Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson series. Oh, got it, got then it. They changed, they changed it to now Dune Legacy because it's going to be, you know, more broader about that, the earlier state, which I'm like, it's like the books takes place like right after the Butlerian Jihad. So it's this like, you know, how do you, once we got rid of the machines, how do this, but you've got, you've got anti-machine zealots and all this other stuff, the house Carino fighting against this and the discovery that, Hey, there's, you know, the spice stuff is pretty damn cool. I, I, uh, we can't go forever, but, um, uh, I, I always thought the Butler, uh, Butlerian Jihad was so dumb, but then I realized like, okay, Mr. Producer, man, how are you going to explain the importance of Mentats with computers? Mm. And it's like, Oh, yeah, no, you got to make computers illegal <laughs> so that you can have human computers and so on. Awesome. Brian? Yep. It's been weird. Nailed it! Here, let me... I'm looking at a prompt database from a prominent AI company that does really good research. And I'm noticing they went in and started with, which is which is totally understandable, some of the the prompts that were originally OpenAI, which are ones that I wrote. And I'm looking at like a couple of them here, going, "Yep, that's that was my template that I made. That's, that's cool. me. <laughs> there I am. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Uh, uh, do we want to do a after things?" Yeah, I'm all for it. If you got time, we could talk about building tools for making work easier. Yeah, let's. Uh, uh, well, here I'm. I'm gonna play some music for a little bit and run to the restroom, and then we'll we'll hop on and do it. But but if we can keep it short, that would be that would be beneficial. Yep. All right, here we go. And. It's an improvement. I essentially tripled the weight of a single stage. So all Wait, nope. Adding... There we go. Two minutes.
Oh, wait, <laughs> did it go silent? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> it just did. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, do, uh, uh, should, should we show off the tool? Yeah, sure. Or, I, I mean, I, we, we can go, uh, yeah, we can go wherever you want. Yeah, we can do that. We can talk about it. I mean, it's. You know, I mean, work in progress, you know. Uh, okay, so. Um, I don't know if I can jump over to the other screen for it, so I may have to. Uh, uh well, here, we, we'll, we'll just talk through the thing. Uh, I, mean, I can share it too. Uh, actually, maybe that would be better because then it'll be more like a product demo um, and we could show off options. Uh, <clears throat> okay. All right. You ready? Yep. Uh, three, two. Hello and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Yo. And if you heard me say half of the word two, it's because... The recording started too early. Whoopsie doodle. But luckily, the robots will acknowledge all of this. Yes. The good old robots. <laughs> Brian, so uh, one of the things that I do is when I consult with companies or work with that and people want to add AI, often they want to add AI at a very high level when sometimes the best way to do it is look for a very low level, simple thing to do. You know, what is a simple repetitive task? The AI can replicate and for just intelligent systems can do that. And on, you know, an example would be, I would say that you, have you noticed it's a lot easier to fill out your address in forms now? I, I, like, like, like on web stuff or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah because I, 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 this is something that my wife and I have been, you know, nutso about for 20 years is like, why is it that every single thing we ever have to do ever involves somebody handing us a clipboard and we have to write down about 17 things and they're always the same things. <laughs> There's gotta yeah. be a better way. <laughs> and and there, the problem becomes like, who is the onus on to solve the problem for, you know, and, and Apple devices, you know, and, and browsers and stuff like, you know, Chrome will do this too they'll store things like your address and make it easier to auto complete to do that. But one of the things that's happened now, like if you go type in your address where you need something delivered to one of the problems with the addresses is, is you really want to make sure that it's an address the post office understands. And that was part of why there was, there was an incentive to solve this problem because companies would get a certain amount of returns on products that were not deliverable because, you know, somebody said court instead of circle or this instead of that. Right. So a lot of forms now use these things. You just start typing in your address and it predicts the rest of it. And it's, it's brilliant. It's using a database of existing addresses. So it just makes it so much easier to get the address because it gives you, instead of making you go through the steps of typing out the full address, then ask you, do you like this form or that form? It's that. So that predictive address solved trouble, solved, made it easier for us to fill out forms. We have to enter our addresses. It also made on the other end, made sure that the companies were not going to be sending things to the wrong place, which is great. And then you think about that, where there's probably a thousand little fixes or things like that, that you can tweak with what you're doing with, you know, different things. Part of the problem is, is that you work with legacy systems. Systems have been around for a long time, like this podcast, um, I mean, I, 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 I'm not trying to actually call out this particular podcast, but we we've been around a minute, Andrew. <laughs> we have, we have this thing. This podcast started in 2008. Was it two? Was it 2008? Uh, 2008. Yeah. So that's hey, a uh, six year. Wait, 16 years. I love doing that. The 16 years of of one technical debt. You know the the weird things that website has not changed at all. By the way, in oh, uh, 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 by by the way, um, I don't think before you said it, I had 
ever heard the phrase technical debt and I, and I rather yeah. like it. it. It intuitively, like I suddenly grokked it the moment you said it. Yeah. So technical debt's a thing we use in the tech industry all the time because you build very fast, then you got to go back and fix everything because things might be inefficient. They might break a lot. They have to have a lot of humans intervene, et cetera. And you're always going to have a certain amount of technical debt if you're moving forward, but you get to a point where it can cause problems. And sometimes you see that when, you know, Cloudflare goes down, which there shouldn't go down. So one is, you know, weird things started off, you know, it's a WordPress site I built on top of that. Because back then there just wasn't the blogging, there wasn't the podcasting tools or any good, you know, like we have now. Like if we're, if we're today, I would just use like transistor.fm or maybe, I don't know, because like they really charge ridiculous rates for storage fees. But anyhow, I'll get into that later. Um, so, you know, we found ourselves in a point where the way that we had to add a podcast to the show was a procedure that had been literally a, a mimeograph of a mimeograph of a mimeograph of the procedure, almost quite literally of literally copying what was in a previous post posted in there. And so after last show, you know, Brian had brought up like, yeah, I got to do this. And then he named the steps that have to go through to go do this. And I'm like, man, you know, I, I talk to companies all the time about how to use AI. <laughs> Maybe we could use something here. And so that's what we did is we walked through the different steps to say, you know, what do you have to do? Well, uh, one is there is there's getting the, the clean audio out, but assuming that we have our clean audio ready to go. Well, we have to do several steps is we have to upload it to this to a server. We then have to go into WordPress and we have to create a title for the podcast. We need to create a show note summary of the podcast, uh, maybe put out what the picks are for the podcast. And then we need to basically, once we do that, maybe generate some episode art or whatever, and then we got to click publish. So, and, and that, like, on, that only gets us to the public feed, and that only gets us to one of the two products that we do because we do both weird things and after things. So while while we uh, humans spend you know ninety minutes having these conversations. Uh, there ends up being these kind of cascading number of like into the twenties of uh, when, 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 when the challenger exploded, they talked about the number of points of failure and uh, uh, I'm not going to say points of failure, but I'm going to say things we have to touch. And it doesn't matter if they get executed in 30 seconds or three minutes it's still like that number gets really, really long. <laughs> yeah. And so the goal is to, if you can reduce the complexity and increase reliability, that's the, that's the sort of what you want to do. So after that, I looked into one, as I knew that uploading to our own thing could be pretty automated because WordPress is very extensible. You can write plugins, you can do sorts of stuff. I then looked into Patreon and found out like, oh man, is that a, is that a primitive platform? Like they, they do not allow. It's a straight up I could find. black box. <laughs> black yeah, there's, a, there's APIs for getting audience data, but there was nothing that I could find for uploading content or whatever, which I'm like, this sucks because I'm really good at working with APIs and connecting stuff to it. But I said, okay, well, let me just try to focus on a, on a thing for weird things. So I'll do a demo here. I'll show the, the tool that we made. And, and this came from, you know, basically saying like, what, what can we do? What it's going to be hard to do. And this will be hilarious if this thing doesn't work. Well, um, uh, uh, basically the question became as, as we talked about it after the show, uh, the question became, uh, what is the thing that you need to put the thing into the thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then yeah. we, and then we spent some time talking about that. And 30 hours later, as I was walking in, to watch Dune, <laughs> I get a phone call from Andrew saying, uh, "Hey, uh, do you have do you have a few minutes to hop on Zoom?" And I said, uh, "No, I'm about to watch Dune." And he's like, "Oh, okay, no big deal. I just spent 30 hours all night <laughs> building a tool that's gonna fix everything." <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was a uh, it was about 24 hours, and like I would say 15 to 16 was mainly. Uh, building the tool, then the rest was figuring out all of the intricacies of, I, to getting to upload it into render.com, which is the thing to replicate it because I used a couple of services like, so it was a little non-standard here, but anyhow, I'll show you here. So this is the screen here. So the goal here is I had a really short message. I actually just created that as a test message to put out onto the 
podcast feed to make sure everything worked. So I upload this, and the first thing that happens is it's created a uh, summary. So I use a very, very fast, fast summarization service uh, from DeepGram, which creates a summary of it. And then I basically used a GPT-4 uh, prompt to do that because there's no picks. There is and, no and, picks and, there, and, but if just... Uh, w- uh, re- real quick, for anybody who's audio only, um, what what we just saw was a simple upload of a simple message. We at first saw a popular... The, the first box to get populated was the one that was a voice translation of everything. Then uh, walk me through what pops up in these other boxes. Right. So first step I did is I, one is I created a, uploaded it. So I uploaded it to, I use Cloudflare. They have a service pro called R2. It's sort of a play on Amazon's S3, which is like anything you've ever used on the web was probably served in an Amazon S3 bucket. But I use R2 because it's actually way cheaper and it's just, it just to me is a much you know smarter way to do it. So it gets uploaded to a bucket, uploaded to a bucket where I can serve the files from. Okay. Then what happens is I send the file to another service. I was using DeepGram and I say, hey, here's a here, if we're using our full episode, like here's an hour of audio, some transcribe it. So it creates a transcription of the full thing. What I like about DeepGram is I don't have to break it up into chunks. I can just send a big, huge chunk of audio and I'll get a transcription. I can use OpenAI's Whisper, which I think is really good, but Whisper, because the way it works is a bit slower. I just use a really fast one because it's not critical transcription. I just need to get the key points. Well, so and, I get and, a transcri- uh, 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 just, just for the un- uniniciated, uh, we're, we're talking about a, a voice transcription dedicated services. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It takes the audio and then it transcribes it. It doesn't, the, the term when it identifies speakers is called speaker diarization I don't do that. I just say, here's some people here. I just have it transcribe it. Then I take the transcript and I have a prompt. I say, Hey, this is the weird things podcast. The usual hosts are, you know, Andrew Maine, Brian Brushwood, blah, blah, blah. They talk about this, create a TLDR, then create a summary. And then if there are picks, give us the list of picks. So you can see here, in, Brian, you can see like it, it wrote the, it gives us a title. It gives us a title, AI Takes the Wheel. Mm-hmm. And then the TLDR was the Weird Things crew apologize for the recent radio science, blaming their AI overlords for the backlog, updates to follow, presumably. <laughs> and then <laughs> it had a longer summary. I, for a little quirky, I told it to be a little bit, you know, a little bit snarky there. And then I have a summary. Um, uh, uh, okay. Uh, sh- then, oh, but the other prompt I said was, create a image prompt to go with this. And so I suggested, you know, whatever. So it wrote a thing. It has a microphone talking to another microphone. And so it generated what we could, we, we could use if we wanted for episode art. So it generates an episode art for it and then gives us a link. And then we're ready. You just click publish and it goes straight to WordPress. Uh, uh, would, would it be remotely interesting? Or may, if not, we can move on to other things. But uh, I, I, can, I can upload... The well, oh no! Let's do the last one we do. Yeah, let's do that. Well, I I, I need to unfortunately um oh sorry uh oh format yeah uh I need to yeah uh, move it to the appropriate format. But I I don't know maybe they won't take as much time as I think. Uh, here I'm gonna open up uh, Adobe Audition, and then I'm gonna uh yeah, you gotta, I'll explain so. What I did on the back end was after using the services to give us the transcript, to give us the summaries, then I went in and basically uh, do what was like create, create basically a remote post for WordPress, which allows you to like, because that's how if you use other applications, WordPress clients, things like that, that aren't built by WordPress by third parties, I use the same thing as one of those to go in there and then say, okay, let me upload a post. And because I don't have to upload the, the podcast file there, just a link to it, it makes it pretty straightforward. So that's the beauty of when things are extensible. Problem I ran into was I was like, cool, I'll because I, I built this thing to detect if it's weird things or after things. Then I'm like, cool, let's just do the same with Patreon because we can upload it to Patreon. I'm like, let me just upload a post with a link to Patreon. Couldn't find it. Could not find it. And I'm going to go look right now to make sure that I, I wasn't stupid and missed something like that. Uh, but I am that certain was you were not stupid. <laughs> yeah. Of all the adjectives I have for Andrew Maine, stupid is not among them. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I mean, they, there might have been their support, Simber, support, whatever. But that was a very frustrating experience is to realize that what should be sort of a standard thing 
to do that. Um, so in this case, know, uh, use- while you're looking that up, um, uh, what I'm doing on my end right now is, uh, uh, number one, it would probably save some time if I recorded audio only with Audition because it wouldn't have to do so much uh, uh, figuring stuff out. But uh, because we use vMix, uh, I'm grabbing the vMix lossy file, and in the amount of time it took me to say this sentence, it is now about 100% imported. And then I'm just going to right click and and uh, select podcast voice. In fact, actually, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm actually I'm gonna uh, uh, you know what? Actually, it's fine. Um, so here I'm is gonna, a. Here's I'm on a long I'm a list full of people on the Patreon developer forum begging for them to add the capability to do that to revoke the right posts. Uh, nope, don't plan to add it. Nope. Well, you can put it on a Patreon and send it to all your other posts. Like, no, your platform sucks. I don't want that to be my source of truth. Like, and then looking forward to it. Me too. Uh, it's quite outrageous. Isn't available, and it's just like going back over years. You know. That's amazing. Uh, okay, so today is the 8th of uh, March. And so I'm going to output this. Uh, we'll, we'll see how long it takes to output the audio on this. Um, yeah. weird Here's things a post requires. from five years ago asking Patreon for this feature. Five years ago. <laughs> five years ago. Do you know what's happened in five years? Open the eye, made. GPT three, GPT four, GPT two. Wars, but Patreon wars and diseases have come and gone in that time. <laughs> oh my god! Just, just. Okay, so we're uh, uh, at twenty percent of exporting the MP three for the Weird Things podcast that we just did. Uh, once it's exported, uh, uh, if, if, Will I be able to send it directly to you so we can watch you upload it? Or what's the best way for me to get it to you? I mean, if you don't want to screen share, then yeah, I'll do it. Um, how big will the file be? Like, what, 90 megabytes? Uh, um, uh, I think less. It, it's reducing everything down to an MP3. So I know, but our MP3s that I've played before have been about 90 megabytes. Okay. Maybe around that. We'll see. Um, yeah, just put it on, like, a Google Drive, and then I'll... I'll download it from there. Okay, so Wait. here, even now while we're talking, I'll go ahead and open up the Google Drive, and then I'll uh, send you a link to it. And I bet by the time you even get the link, uh, then then we'll be able to. You'll be able to download it. Uh, well, let's see. Oh, WT. That's what I have. So, uh, by the way, if if you think this is taking a long time, <laughs> you should have seen the before times. Oh, yeah, before times. The never, never. Okay, so uh, now I'm grabbing, looking for the MP3. Uh, let's see. Yep, 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 yep. Oh, 0308. There it is. There you go. So I'm going to do that. I believe you're already shared. It's going to take less than a minute to upload this to you. And this is adding a step that we normally wouldn't even have to do. But uh, it's already halfway uploaded. Um, uh, if you... I believe... Yeah, yeah. You have access to it. It's just the folder. I don't called, see anything yet. Uh, WT. There it is. Just showed up. I, I don't see anything yet. Uh, well, here, I'll, I'll share it and I'll copy you a link. And then I'm going to go to the text. Look at this. We're, we're doing process right here in front of everyone. See it? Yep. There we go. So that is uh, in real time. We took the uh, complete video file. We imported it to Audition. We swapped it over to uh, use podcast voice best practices presets. And now we're going to publish it. And the only part that we can't do is have it automated that it'll go to Patreon as well. But meanwhile, uh, 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 if, if, if you can, Andrew, I'd love to watch it populate and 
come up with the album art and all that stuff. Yeah, so let's go ahead and go to... Here, I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. All right. Let's share. Could you imagine back in the day how fast this this could happen? That's so bonkers. Okay, so now we have the podcast uploader, and it looks like uh, we got gears rolling, which means it's being uploaded. Uh, yeah, one little interface trick that I always try to do, and this is basic, but like Andrew Ryan explained, it's basic. Well, because people forget, and I forget, is when you're waiting on a process, tell people you're waiting for it, even if there's a lot of different processes going on behind the scenes, because nothing sucks more than to have been waiting a long time for doing something. And I have these little pop-up messages that tell you as each thing goes in there, it's like, uploading a file, and it's doing that. And then, um, let's go increase the screen size here. And it's 90 megabytes. So right now it should be sending that over to the service that is going to do the transcription. Assuming everything works, we're still in our alpha. Test. Oh man, we, we really up. are flying without a net right now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we were hey, both... everybody watch this live demo. <laughs> we, Look how clever we are. We, we were very excited at the beginning. We may, we may be about to have to eat our butts on this one. <laughs> well, you know, what happened, too, was that in testing, I was using smaller file sizes, and that was fine when I was using uh, OpenAI's Whisper across the API, but they have to be under 25 megabytes, and that was causing a problem, and then there was a length problem here. So I'm going to go check into my background server. Just This normally takes us long, but I'm just having anxiety right now, so let me go ahead and make sure the server That's is fine. working. But, uh, uh, oh, file transcription starting, so we got the message there. So it's still doing that thing. So it uploaded it. It sent that file over there. There, there You can have problems, too. You can come up, like, let's say it sends it to that other API, and I ran out of credits over there or something, you know. Oh, there, oh, we go. there it is. Complete. That's the show we just did. Yep, yep. Uh, so all of a sudden, this is all of the text that we did during the entire show that uh, it, it, it's not formatted in any particular way, but... No, it's not a high-quality transcription. Right. And look... So it oh, my picks. God. Oh, my God. So 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 it... it uh, uh, oh, man, I want to say... Can, can, can you zoom in on... on uh, this because like it, it now it, it identified my voice. It identified Andrew's voice. It identified the subject matter of the, we talked about rockets. Tell, and what, tell what we're looking at. Now we noticed the woolly man has too many tusks on one side, but I'm going to generate that again. I saved that one. So we, we have a podcast art generator here and it's actually kind of kick-ass podcast art. I'm not going to lie. Other than, <laughs> I mean, it's this is amazing. Okay, okay. So the podcast art. If you you listen to the episode, we talked about woolly mammoths. We talked about uh, rockets going into space and all that stuff. Uh, and and what you have is this awesome pen and ink drawing uh, with with like uh, a, a perfect framing on it that does actually <laughs> encapsulate the stuff that we talked about on the show. <laughs> and then. And then meanwhile, uh, 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 let's see, it says, uh, um, oh, uh, can, can you scroll up? Uh, like, I, uh, what do you want to see? Uh, oh, I, I, it accurately identifies that your pick, that the picks are Andrew picks plasma channel on YouTube. Brian picks Dune part two. That was entirely automated from just the context of the show, uh, it comes up with the title, A Deep Dive into Space Technology and Woolly Mammoths. Andrew, Justin, and Brian discuss SpaceX's uh, strategy, blah, 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 blah. Iterative, iterative, sorry. Uh, iterative explosion strategy, the history and future of space travel, Apple's VR headset, resurrecting woolly mammoths, and the potential of hydrogen production from Earth's core. Uh, yep. Wow. And then, and then there it is. It's now, uh, set, uh, it's now hosted at weirdthingspodcast.com and we have album art and then with one click, suddenly hours of work vanish. 
<laughs> and then all I have and, to and do, and the the album art, which we never bothered even doing. Yeah, yeah, no, because that's hard. <laughs> You're just gonna keep generating more album art. That's amazing. <laughs> I knew it'd be just fun to click that and create new versions. Uh, how amazing! Uh. Uh, 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 by the way, we're getting requests from the chat, like, feed this into DC TVpedia. Uh, yes, we, we could probably, if anybody wants to spearhead that project, let's let's get on that, reach out to us. But uh, my word, it's not just that the tool works so good, it's that you made it in over, literally overnight. Like, it's incredible. Sorry, I I've made know. a lot of stuff like this, you know. So I mean, for me, it's not like it wasn't a complete blank page. I mean, I all the code was like from blank page, but like, you know, I played with these tools for doing, you know, transcriptions. I played. With, I had to figure out like I never used DeepGram before, and that was useful. Um, I found uh, that out that night. Well, here you you I'm gonna open up WeirdThings.com, and uh, uh, I'm gonna see the way it looks right now. Oh, I, I'll, I'll click publish, I and then you could this, click so. publish. Right. Hold, hold on one second. So, so this is this is what weird things looks like right now, and then Andrew, go ahead and click publish. And again, we have again, you have to go in and to make it go live. It only it's only going to go to draft mode. I'll go in and switch it to, from there. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Be because that was the safety feature you wanted was okay. Oh so yeah, so because I didn't want to accidentally screw it up when, when I was doing stuff. No, Penny, don't press that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the podcast that we just did all of twenty three minutes ago is now uh, uh, punched up, interpreted, slotted in, uploaded and ready for publish on this yeah. website. So I'm going to add I, what I have to do here. I like, I, I should probably add in the category right now. I got to go put the categories for podcasts and podcasting. Cause oh, yeah, because that's, it. that's how it goes on the RSS feed. I can do that. I can do that in the code. I had that in the code, but just as a safety measure, you know, I wasn't doing that. So, uh, save draft. Now let's click publish. Let's see if this worked. If you're listening to this, we assume that it worked. <laughs> uh, well, uh, <laughs> is it time for me to hit refresh? Yep. All right. Ah! Look at that. That's so awesome. <laughs> Show your screen. I'll stop sharing so you can share your screen. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's exactly how you would hope. It's, it's awesome album art. The title says, A Deep Dive into Space Technology and Woolly Mammoths, posted by Andrew Main on March 8th, 2024. It's got a rocket. It's got, uh, 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 it looks like an ornithopter, because maybe I talked about Dune. Uh, it's got a woolly mammoth in this amazing art style. And it says, in this episode, Andrew Main, Justin Robert Young, and Brian Brush would kick things off with a chat about SpaceX's upcoming Starship launch and the company's approach to failure as a step towards innovation. They delve into the history of space travel, highlighting the space shuttle's design compromises and the importance of testing. The conversation shifts to Apple, Apple's VR headset and Brian sharing his mixed feeling, uh, feelings about his practicality and Apple's missed opportunity to create compelling content for spatial computing. The trio then explores the ambitious project of resurrecting woolly mammoths by colossal biosciences, discussing the scientific and ethical implications. Lastly, they touch upon the intriguing possibility of naturally occurring hydrogen production within Earth, which could revolutionize energy sources. Picks, Andrew, Plasma Channel on YouTube. Brian, Dune, Part 2, Link, support Weird Things on Patreon, subscribe to the Weird Things Podcast on iTunes, Link, 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 Link. Oh my god, it's so good, Andrew! It's so good! Let's see, let me go to... Uh... Mm -hmm. Checking my podcast feed now.
Oh, I was about to say, like, like, is this the moment where we say, I, I am become death? <laughs> Destroy your own worlds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, it might take a few minutes for it to cash, but um, yeah. So there you go. Uh, so now all I have to do, uh, uh, well, number one, I, I guess I'll be the one to press that button. Uh, but then uh, I'll take that MP3 and I'll just copy paste all of that into Patreon. Patreon's the one, the one spoiled stepchild of the whole thing. But uh, man, yeah, I, I already clicked publish. So yeah, just Patreon now. Uh, I I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, th this was. It was, it was magic on Saturday, and it's magic today. It's amazing. <laughs> Till it breaks and starts and just spinning. Ah. But, it, it, but I think about this. This is a uh, so uh, Claude three, which is Anthropic's latest model, uh, came out uh, this week or last week. Very strong model. Very very good. Capable. Uh, Google had Gemini Ultra, which. GPT-4 equivalent, I would say, maybe it exceeds, but maybe not as good in other places, not in general reasoning. I think Claude 4 is really good. I think Claude, Floor, Claude 3 is a better model than, than Ultra, in my experience, and this is not. But we're at the point where there's three solid GPT-4-esque level models. And uh, these things are going to get better. But let's assume they only got a little bit better. If they only got a little bit better, look at how far we got with a GPT-4 level model and automating our workflow. The only blocker we, and I could, I, I could build, if I wanted to get really crazy, I could build an AI agent that would log into Patreon for me, go to the site and actually, in which you're going to get a lot of that. That's going to be a lot of stuff because companies that are just too under-resourced, don't prioritize adding APIs and stuff, they're going to soon find out that bots are just going to figure out how to do it themselves. But, you know, that we're able to build like a process like that, you know, to, to build, you know, if I wanted to take this thing and, and scale this into a product that a lot of other people could use, I don't think there's a lot of, you know, like it's a really good business model, but it's just not hard. And, and you're going to get to the point too, with probably within a year, either through chat GPT or something, you might just upload your file to chat GPT and say, clean up my audio, then upload it to weird things and never even need an idiot like me to build an app. Well, and if you have a rich enough library, I, I don't want to go all the way back into weird things territory, but um, if, if, if you have a long enough history of being a podcaster or whatever, it's able to, you know, smooth over the rough parts of your voice and, or your vocal hitches or your stammers and stutters and all that stuff. It's like, fix mm -hmm. this, make it, it, well, you know what I mean, go, you know. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. All right. I don't, I don't think we're going to beat that. Also, I need to publish after things now. <laughs> well, Brian, it's been after. Yeah. Wow. This is going to be a much faster publishing process. <laughs> that was rad. I'm so glad it worked. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of fun to see you get a little bit nervous. <laughs> oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's just that you, there's things. I'm like, I think I control it for everything because I did larger file size. But I'm like, oh, what if I forgot to, you know, pay for my API key on the other side or something? Are we still live in front of everybody? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, although uh, we can go and I wrap have it a up. book coming out. Oh, oh, so, yeah, I oh, forgot to plug go for it. My go book, for it. Uh, dark, dark, dark Dive's coming out next week. So, Dark Dive. Dark Dive. Dark Dive. Dark Dive. So long, beautiful people. Going off the air in five, four. Three, two, one.